And we are live. Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger. It is such a pleasure to be here. I don't know, at the beginning here, it just reminds me, I've been doing this for 15 and three quarters years. It'll be six year, 16 years in June. And uh, how lucky I feel, really fortunate to be on this journey. When I started out, this actually was how I came out of the spiritual closet was the show. And I started out talking about creating dreams because at that time in my life, it was a huge awakening. Oh, you can actually think of something you desire and want to create out in the world. And that there are actually steps you can do it. And I started living a big, a way bigger life than I had previously. And I got so excited. I wanted to share it with people and there's a big story about even how I got here from being an actress and a singer. But the point is, I arrived here. I know the universe meant me to be here. And it started out just as creating dreams. But as I went on and I started to notice the guests I had, it was in a radio station in Hollywood to start with. And I started to realize, hmm, that those were interesting people. Those were interesting people. But the people who were metaphysical or who cha channeled or had some kind of inherent deep wisdom, they were changing my life. This became my masterclass. And thank you to all of you, because as I shifted, you came with me. That's not always true. A lot of people out in the world have to rebrand themselves. And I questioned often, am I still dare to dream? How does that work? But I would follow energy because it's the one thing I knew how to do. And my curiosity was the most important thing because I wanted to show up for the best conversation that excited me. And so I shifted deeply into spirituality and I came out of the spiritual closet and I realized, oh, this is the journey. This is the greatest value in my life. And then at some point I became abundantly aware that all that stuff about ETs and UFOs actually exist. That it wasn't just some people I interviewed now and then who were famous and kind of interesting, but I didn't really believe, but I had a huge turn, a huge awakening when I said, this is truth. And again, I questioned, dare to dream. Is that the right name for the show? Should I rebrand? Because now I'm following this path and adding it. It's so important to me. Fairies, all of this conversation, I believe, I believe I've experienced. Now I've experienced. And you all came. You shifted with me. Nobody questioned, nobody stopped. In fact, more joined. And so I'm so deeply grateful to all of you for being on this journey. I send you so much love for being my avid watchers, listeners, and for sending myself and my guests so much love. Well, today is no exception because yay, today I've got Nora Harold here and she channels a multitude of high vibe beings such as the Pleiadian Collective, Yeshua, Kalendra, Inara, the Lyrans and Lemurians, the fairies and the angelics. And let me tell you, a lot of those words are very powerful for me. So I'm very grateful that we are here and doing the show today. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness. And if you want to do energy work with them or become a facilitator, go to drdanehere.com, H-E-E-R, or accessconsciousness.com and join them there. The show has won the C-O-V-R Award for Best Radio Podcast Show, listed in Welt Magazine as one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to, listed as a top self-improvement podcast on Apple Podcasts, nominated for two People's Choice Awards and for a Webby Award. And I do, mis I do uh, media visibility work out into the world. And thank you, folks. It's so cool to meet some of you who join me and work with me. I'm a book writing coach. I show you how to write a page turner and a highly engaging book in a world where you want to stand out from the rest of the books being published. I independently run a company that takes your book to a guaranteed international best-selling status. And last, I show spiritual messengers how to be interviewed on radio and podcasts and get massive results. So if you are ready to be visible, and boy, is it your time, <laughs> noticing everything going on in the world, if you are here to herald this new time, join me. I'm happy to show you how to do it, and I'm happy to give you a free gift to do it. Go to debbie-inger.com slash gift and get your templates and videos so I can show you how. It's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R dot com slash 
gift. So indeed, today, my guest is the amazing Nora Harold, who's been channeling, lecturing, and delivering healing work for over 30 years. In 1996, Nora established conscious contact with the Pleiadians and her spirit guides, which triggered an awakening of her abilities and gave her access to her own records. In 2007, she began receiving information, sharing specific techniques to facilitate the integration of the fifth dimensional identity and the reascension process, which has become the foundation of her work. Nora offers private sessions, teaches, lectures, is a Reiki master, has appeared on film, radio, and TV, and has channeled for people all around the world. Nora lives in Ojai, California with her partner, Jonathan Wilk, and their animal companions. If you would like to learn more about her, go to N-O-R-A, Herald, H-E-R-O-L-D, dot com, Nora Herald, dot com. Com. And with that, I welcome the amazing Nora to Dare to Dream. Boy, it's so good to have you. Hi, Debbie. Hello, everybody. It's so wonderful to be here <laughs> with the amazing Debbie. Oh, my <laughs> God. You. You're the most yummy, yummy uh, energy. Have you always been like this? Always been so joyous? Uh, that's a good question. Mm, you know, yes, and then no, and then yes again is the answer, <laughs> right? Yes, came out this way, and then life, uh, and then found it again, yes. And I think it's, you know, it's the channeling, and uh, specifically, I think the work with, with the fairies <laughs> that really um, emboldens my joy and helps me transmit it. Oh, how cool. I didn't expect you to say that, but it makes so much sense because yeah. of their their energy, their luminescent energy. Have you been seeing and experiencing your whole life, these different realms? So yes and no, and then again, yes, <laughs> right? So it goes with the joy. Um, you know, when I was up until about the age of 10, I would say eight to 10, somewhere in that window, I... I was very, I was very much a seeker as a little girl. Hmm. Do you remember the show In Search Of? Yes. Yeah. So me and my dad would watch that every week and I was so into it, right? I was like at eight years old, I was like, yeah, aliens are real and fairies are real, right? It just, it, I just felt that so strongly. And then divorce and mm -hmm. trauma and right. So I just didn't have the bandwidth then to be in that space. I was very focused on survival and my emotional reality. And then in college, I had a reading um, from a tarot reader and she suggested that I get my own deck. She picked up on my kind of inherent, intuitive, psychic, seeing, hearing, feeling abilities. And I said, you know, well, isn't it that somebody's supposed to give you a tarot deck as a gift? Like, isn't it that you're not supposed to buy it for yourself? And she just kind of laughed and said, yeah, that's just superstitious beliefs. And I'm like, okay, got it. And uh, got a deck of tarot cards and just completely dove into it. Tarot was my gateway <laughs> drug to <laughs> all that I do now. Um, and yeah, so that was my origins of kind of coming back. And yeah, I heard that tarot can actually activate somebody mm. that when you've, you already have, let's say latent gifts that when you start using the tarot, they can actually wake them up and you can connect through the tarot to your gifts. So you're really giving these wild, accurate readings and information to people. Yes, and that's that's how I experienced it for almost 10 years, right? So that was like the age of 19 to 29. I worked with tarot and I was interested in crystals and astrology, and but I was also an actress and a waitress. So we have the same origins. Mine is Chicago uh, theater and I worked professionally in Chicago theater for... Uh, uh, 
majored in theater at Columbia College. You, know, you just had Sheldon Epson, which is so amazing to me. I was so overjoyed to see you highlighting Sheldon and his work. And I have an important Sheldon in my life. Sheldon Patinkin was the head of the theater department at Columbia College in Chicago, and he was one of the originators of Second City. So I just love that we share that. We share that, and then the Sheldon thing just completely tickled me. Um, it's funny, I have this little button, Sheldon has passed now, and I have this little button on my desk, and it says, uh, better to be an asshole than chicken shit, which was one <laughs> of Sheldon's phrases. And by asshole, he means better to make a fool of yourself, right? Not to be a jerk. By asshole, he means better to risk it than yes. to be afraid to risk. And so much of that was given to me in college hmm. that support to try to go farther and i i went from you know very white middle class suburban experience to the diversity of an inner city chicago college which just also awakened my consciousness right so i have these different levels of awakening that have occurred throughout my life that have caused me to look at my own prejudices and programming, mm -hmm. you know, because again, I grew up in a very white and in large part, very uh, bigoted home in one of my parents. And then there I was with gay people and black people and trans people who had yet even perhaps knew they were trans, right? And that was so just immediately Mm, expanding for me and I see that as woven into my work all of it right all of this all the experiences I had throughout my teenage years and my 20s is leading me to the moment where then I established conscious connection with my spirit guide Miranda and that happened when I was 29. Mm, what is that relationship like? Mirando. It's funny because I don't really work with Mirando much any longer. Mm. He was, he was um, like, he's laughing now to hear me say that. Right? Like, I work totally, with you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and I know that's true, but in, in public facing work, Mirando is not, he, he, I've channeled him maybe once or twice publicly. Mirando is my support staff. Mm -hmm. That's very personal energy for me. In my first meeting with Mirando, I was hanging out with a friend. We were reading each other's tarot cards. And she told me about someone she just met who channels. And I said, you know, what is that talking to dead people? Because that was my <laughs> understanding. <laughs> and she said, well, you know, you could do that when you channel. But she channels her spirit guides. And when my friend Amy said spirit guides, it is something clicked inside of me. It was this, I had been seeking for a long time. So Tarot was fulfilling pieces of it, but it wasn't the whole thing. And I knew that. So she and I then said, okay, let's, let's try it. Let's, let's try to connect and see what happens. So, you know, we're like hanging out in her apartment midnight, you know, just playing. It was very playful. And we both just quieted ourselves. And there was nobody present to tell me I couldn't do it. There was nobody there to say it was hard. There was nobody there in any way making it difficult for me or creating any kind of obstacle. Um, and it was very, the connection was almost immediate. Like as soon as Amy said to me, spirit guide, I went, oh yeah, that's right. I know they're with me. And it was like going back to childhood then. I know fairies are real. I know guides are real. I know, I know it from a very clear cognizant place inside of me, a level of certainty. And I felt this energy connect with me. He felt mailed to me. I knew his name started with an M. I saw this, saw, I don't really see, I'm not very clairvoyant, but I knew had a sense of his light as this brilliant yellow, kind of yellowish light. Uh, but what I felt was this unconditional love that was unlike anything I had ever experienced as Nora before. I had never been loved like that before, you know, it because we can't as humans love in the way they love us. It's a different relationship. As humans, we are complicated by our stuff, 
right? Mm -hmm. With them, there's no stuff. Mm -hmm. There's just enduring love and support. Mm -hmm. And it was a life altering experience for me. I, I walked into my friend's apartment, one version of myself, and I left at four in the morning, completely altered, uh, began immediately having past life memories, remembered how to run energy through my body to facilitate healing for those around me. I was getting constant, constant information, feedback about everyone I was interacting with while waiting tables, right? <laughs> Which was a total mm -hmm. mind fuck. Like mm -hmm. it was so hard to manage, right? Wow. Like here's your here's your beer. Oh, I see. There's some drama in this relationship. Oh, okay, I'm gonna go in the kitchen <laughs> and shake that off. And then one night I literally went into the kitchen yelled up at the ceiling and just said shut up three times right and all the cooks just looked at me like oh there's Nora doing her thing and um I heard very clearly we are always transmitting it is up to you whether or not to listen that's a big job that's a tall order and I know many gifted people who have said I can't even go to Hollywood Bowl if mm -hmm. you know what that is because mm -hmm. there's thousands, tens of thousands of seats. And with every person comes their own entourage of past lives and entities attached to them and ghosts and et cetera. And they're overwhelmed with the information. So have you learned to modulate all of that? Yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty quick. And um, I have pretty strong boundaries. And things only slip through on a need to know basis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's, That's the way great. I like to frame it, right? On a need to know basis. And I mean, if I want in any moment, I could turn my head just a bit. And that's kind of the way I see it, right? So my focus is here on me, 3D life and my body. And then I turn my head just a bit and oh, there's all the other stuff. Wow. It's all there, immediate. So I've just learned mm -hmm. where to place my focus. And this only gets louder if I'm not focusing on it, if I really need, if something needs to come into my awareness. Beautiful. And you know, when, while you're sharing that, Nora, it reminds me of what I read in your bio, which is that at that point you had gained access to your own records. Yeah. So <laughs> this is, this is huge. So we're saying you're a Kosh, like yeah. uh, not just, so we're talking about the library from the inception of your soul in every concurrent multidimensional lifetime, et cetera. Yes. Although, you know, it took a while and it's, I mean, it's an ongoing process. Who am I kidding? I haven't even, you know, accessed, <laughs> right? 50% of that data, I'm sure. But what came through almost immediately was a lifetime I had on Atlantis that began actually on Lemuria and then uh, went to Atlantis. And part of the reason for that is because Amy, my dear friend, was with me in that life, as was Wendy Kennedy another very well-known channel who is a dear friend of mine and uh wendy is the third person in the trio there so the three of us would get together right 1996 how many years ago is that 24 five years ago something like that right Ma math is just not my strong suit <laughs> um and the three of us knew each other in atlantis and then the three of us came back together in this life uh, to support each other in our channeling connection journeys, which is kind of, you know, remarkable and profound. And what was so cool is, as I would start to gain access to a specific memory of something that had occurred, like I'd get a piece of it and then the rest of it would come out of Amy's mouth. Mm. So there was just this constant validation between the three of us that made going farther, faster, really easy to have yeah, that support. I love that your souls had that agreement Yeah, because it might've not been such an easy road to toe yeah. if you had been alone, but the fact that you all said, yeah, we'll do it together and we'll be there to support and, you know, reactivate each other. Yep. That's, that's quite beautiful. And I know because I've been following you as well, that in your global transmissions, that it's been said and channeled that now is a really good time for us to be gentle with ourselves. Mm. And I'm sure you could say that at any point, mm. right? But this is a profound time in history. Can you illuminate why now especially is important for us to be very gentle with ourselves? Yes, greetings, Debbie. This is the Pleiadian Collective. It is wonderful 
to have the opportunity to connect with you and all of your wonderful listeners tuning in. Thank you. Thank you for having us here. Thank you for inviting Nora to be a part of this so we can be here with you. So in answer to your question, you're moving through what we're calling the acceleration of the shift. So as things are accelerating and becoming more intense, it's in some ways becoming more challenging to be here. And if you move too quickly and are too hard or harsh with yourself right now, you're going to miss the opportunity to heal that which is coming up for healing. And this is a big period of healing for you all. Part of, part of what you came in to do in this life is a piece of integration and reascension. So let us, let us talk about that for a minute, kind of our story, what our story is about re, in, uh, integration and reascension, because there are a lot of stories out there. And from our perspective, there's not any one story that tells the whole story, right? There's not any be all and end all story. You've tried that on your world with the Bible, right? And it hasn't really worked. So you all, well, many of you know, ah, okay, that's a story. We give a story. So we don't want to create dogma in your reality. There's too much of it already. We want you to take what resonates for you and leave what does not. So the story we tell and you could also call this mythology or metaphor. It doesn't really matter. Again, it's what works for you. The story we tell is that on the winter solstice of 2012, the old way of being on planet Earth ended and a new way began. And the new way is a gateway into the integration of the fifth dimensional consciousness or your higher self, and we use those terms interchangeably, into the density of your physical bodies, specifically from the heart chakra on down to the root. So prior to the winter solstice of 2012, a lot of you had integrated that fifth dimensional consciousness into your upper chakra system, right? So you can see that on your world, just this expansion, especially as you hit the year 2000, this expansion of ideas around spirituality and metaphysics and channeling and right, all of it became suddenly much more popular, much more talked about. But there was not a real ability yet to live it in a very grounded and real way. This is the change that occurred on the winter solstice of 2012. The initiation into living from your fifth dimensional consciousness. And truly right now, it's a blending of the third and the fifth dimensional consciousnesses. Because you don't want to dissolve your ego. Your ego is who you are. It's your person. It's you as a human. Your egos are beautiful. They're magnificent, right? The ego often gets a bad rap in the new age community. And we don't, we don't have that take on it. We think your egos are wonderful. They're part of the reason of coming to planet Earth. So what you're doing now is you are allowing that fifth dimensional energy to begin to make its way down into your lower chakra system. And to be able to do that, that means you have to heal the shit that's getting in the way. Because if you have untransmuted trauma sitting in the lower chakra system, and you all do, that's by and large where you carry it because the lower chakra system connects you more directly to the earthly experience. The upper chakra system connects you more directly to the out there <laughs> experience. So if you're trying to bypass it, if you're trying to love and light it to death without actually diving in to your shadow, feeling what there is to be felt and accepting and unconditionally loving yourself more, you're going to continue to have obstacles in the integration process. And this is what being gentle is about. Being gentle from our perspective is being able to say, wow, I was a huge asshole just now. 
And I can claim that and own that and recognize that I operated in this way because my fear got activated based on earlier trauma in this life. And I hold that fear in my second chakra. So in this moment, I'm going to breathe some love into my body, accept myself exactly as I am without judgment, and then offer that love, that unconditional love to any version of me in any moment of time and space that needs it in any lifetime. Because the healing is not just about this lifetime experience. It's about many lifetimes experiences. Powerful, so powerful. And sometimes, you know, and obviously the shadow takes many forms and it's like you said, owning where we're irresponsible and maybe off track, misaligned and to right the ship. There's also the trauma that creates a victimhood. And in victimhood, it, I think it can be really hard to clean up because you're cleaning up old trauma, right? Where the inception of what happened, where the beliefs and the experience that gets replicated began. And then what's happening currently under that paradigm that you, uh, you know, people want so desperately to break free of and say, I don't want to do this in my life anymore. I yes. don't want this experience anymore. Yes. Can you address that? Yes, this is the Pleiadians here. You know, part of part of the thing that we see that really facilitates healing the aspects of you that feel victimized is allowing yourself to fully embrace the truth that you were victimized in those earlier moments. To not bypass that truth. And that's a little contrary sometimes to the belief system right now. But what you can see is that if you say to yourself, well, I chose that suffering because that suffering was going to teach me a lesson and it was going to lead me to this greater truth. What you're doing there is you're saying that suffering is good. And not just that, that suffering is necessary. And this is one of the things that shifted on the winter solstice of 2012. So up until that point, you were all caught in a loop of suffering on planet Earth. And you collectively, humanity, took in the ideology that not only was suffering good in some way because it encouraged growth, but that suffering was necessary, that it was needed for no pain, no gain. Right? Yes, exactly. What doesn't kill me makes me stronger. stronger. Yes. Nora likes to say, what doesn't what didn't kill her just fucked her up, right? That's <laughs> <laughs> more accurate from her perspective. We'll use her words there. So from our perspective, it's never been suffering that's been the fuel for growth. It's love. It's always love. Can you explain that? What do you mean it's always been love? Love is, there are two versions of love that you work with on planet Earth. There is love the feeling state, which is really a compilation of many different emotions all wrapped up together that you call love. Then there is love as a state of being. The truth that love is actually who we all are in this universe. We are all, you are all love incarnate. So as you access that truth from within, I am love incarnate. And that's a truth that the higher self slash fifth dimensional consciousness holds at all times. The higher self never wavers off of that point. The higher self always knows that they are love incarnate. So as you integrate that truth more deeply into your third dimensional structures, then you become outwardly more loving. This is Nora, I'll speak personally about it, right? So I experienced a lot of childhood abuse. And for a long time, I told myself that that abuse made me the person I am. But as I said earlier in my interview, it didn't make me the person I am. It was a huge off-ramp to who I was. And it took me a lot of healing, therapy, a lot of different avenues to bring myself back to my awareness that I am love incarnate and this reality is magic. That's the love piece. If the abuse hadn't existed, I would have gotten here earlier. Yeah, I'm, thank you so much for sharing that, Pleiadians and Nora. And, and 
while you're saying this, I, I completely concur. I completely understand the love piece so much. And what is popping for me is boundaries. Yes. Right. So we can be this enormous, not everybody is, not yeah. everybody is, and it's not their path. I know I am. I came with a huge heart full of love and it's an interesting path I chose. So where do, with all this love and the healing of love and the choice of love and not dragging forward, I just want to pull all the pieces you said, because they were yeah, so yeah, yeah. eloquent, which yeah. was to really allow ourselves the truth. Yeah, I what I did have a shit experience. Yeah, this really was very difficult, and God yeah. bless that I did the work to get myself to who I am and where yes. I am today. That's yes. the love, right? That's the love. The work is the love. Yes, that's the love. The and suffering the, is not the love. That's right. We don't want to drag the suffering forward. We don't want to repeat. Right. Certainly, uh, because it's only self-repeated, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's all an illusion anyway. So we don't want to keep perpetrating that. So with these are beings of love and many in the spiritual tribe truly are beautiful creatures. Where do boundaries come in? So it's not just an open bleeding heart. Yes. But it's being loved, but also that there are boundaries and protection. Yes, this is the Pleiadian. So anger is the gateway to boundaries. <laughs> anger is the emotion you all gave yourselves on planet Earth so you could recognize when it is either your boundaries are being violated or are about to be violated activate your will and take yourself to safety or create a safe container. Boundaries are essential. Anger is essential. And it gets such a bad rap on your world because anger and rage are confused. Rage is a byproduct of unhealed trauma. Rage is that out of control, horrible feeling that when it's coming out of you, there's that voice back there saying, stop, stop, and you can't because your trauma is just bleeding through and screaming out of you. Anger, when felt in its truest, unadulterated essence, is pleasurable. It's a flash of light through the body that allows you to say no, and no means no, right? That's it. And that's love. That in and of itself is love, setting that kind of boundary. Mm, I love that so, so much. Um, thank you. I know, Pleiadians, that some of what you facilitate, I find it really fascinating, the deactivation of implants, the we're talking about trauma right now, and the activation of creator abilities, mm -hmm. Can you talk some about how that is facilitated, how we might be able to engage some of that in ourselves or disengage from some of that in ourselves? Yes. So when we speak about implants, we're talking primarily about outdated beliefs that sit in your consciousness, mm -hmm. that act as a filtering agent to a higher level of being here in the body or more empowered being. Let's say more empowered, right? Because higher level of being, right, sounds so superior and that's a problem from our perspective. So more empowered, right? More, more grounded and empowered in the body. So if your implant tells you, oh, well, it's not appropriate for me to be having telepathic communication with beings who sit in another dimension, that's going to be problematic if you're wanting to establish those kinds of contacts and connections. And when you all uh, incarnated, you all came in with a series of implants installed that allowed you to exist in the reality you were incarnating into at the point of entry. So for those who incarnated 50, 60, 70 years ago, they have a lot more implants than those who incarnated 20, 30, 10 years ago, right? Because the game has continued to change. And as the collective consciousness expands and shifts, then what is permissible and what is not expands and shifts as you inhabit the body. So for those of you who came in some time ago, <laughs> let's say, right? <laughs> to deactivate an implant, here's how you'll notice it's existing. You'll feel it in your third chakra. 
because the third chakra is directly connected to the mental body and the implants always have um, a mental piece to them. They have a thought form connected to them. So what will happen is you'll you'll start to head down a path and then you'll you'll feel that that anxiety in your third chakra. And that's an outdated implant firing off. Mm. So in that moment, what you can do is you can inhale some golden light into your heart and your crown. Exhale and flush your system with golden light D, with the intention to deactivate that implant. And again, the integration of the higher self into the lower chakra system also facilitates just automatically the deactivation of these implants because the 5D consciousness doesn't have any of the obstacles. And the implants are necessary, right? They help you navigate time as linear and your physical reality as solid, matter as solid. So you can't deactivate all of them, of course, or you wouldn't be able to exist here on planet Earth in the 3D. You're, you would be done with the game. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh, that was so beautiful. I love that. And that's very simple to do in real time. And how interesting that people beyond their 20s right now came in with so many more implants, a little bit more work to do. Yeah. Yeah. I know. And I really, this is Nora, I notice it when I'm in private session that for me, I noticed there was a huge differentiation. This is something I noticed maybe about 10 years ago between anyone who came in prior to 1960 and anyone who came in after 1960. So there was a big shift that occurred there in that that was so that that feels to me like a similar gateway to the gateway we moved through on the winter solstice of 2012. So I came in 1967. So I, I, and John, my partner came in in 1960. So sometimes mm-hmm. I can see that, that difference. Like when we're having heated conversations about things, I'm like, just, why don't you just get this? Right. Like, <laughs> yes. But he's on the cusp of having more implants and <laughs> yes, less implants. Yes. And you know, he, he is a Reiki master. He channels, mm-hmm. he's a full partner in my work. So he's, you know, he's very, his consciousness is very expanded. He's been wonderful for me, actually, in so many ways in support, but also in helping me um, access my anger. He was very good at that coming into the relationship in a way that I was not. You know, I was raised Catholic in a very repressed household. Uh, he's Jewish, where there was just a lot of right, experience. <laughs> totally. <laughs> so yeah, he was really good for me with that anger piece. And I remember the first time I really had a, like a six months in me had this just big fight, right? I threw my car keys, which is something like I would never do. And afterwards, we were sitting on the couch with each other, I don't know, eating ice cream, right, having fun. And I was like, oh, holy shit! Like you can have a fight. And then still be with a the person, they still love you, where the anger didn't cancel out the love. God, that is so important, by the way. That's something I observe a lot because I think I've always, well, we want a healthy relationship to start with, right? We don't want a lot of wounds playing out in people and triggering and re-triggering that's not being resolved. So let me say that as a pre-caveat. Correct. But that said, I've always observed that in a relationship, one of the most important things exactly is that you can love, you can fight, but it's the crossroads and it's the where you make the choice, right? And if you choose, well, we're fighting, I'm I'm totally out. This is unacceptable. Well, pfft. You have no good luck. You have yeah, exactly. To go. You're never going to be in a re- you're never going to be in a long term relationship. Right? John and I have been together 24 years. If he and I spent 24 years together and never fought, we would be insane, right? Because that energy has to go somewhere. And yeah, your partner is going to trigger you. It's just part of this reality. And healing, I've noticed for myself, like things will trigger me, and then I'll work through them and. Ah, okay. You can save that idiotic fucking thing to me and it doesn't bother me anymore or whatever, right? That trigger isn't there. And then a few years pass and then, oh, that trigger is up again. Uh, This is the Pleiadians here. And that's because as you are continually accelerating through your shift in consciousness now, uh, as you up level to a higher vibratory state, Anything that you cleared on lower vibrational levels that, well, they come up again on the next level for clearing. 
But what you'll find is, oh, well, that thing used to really make me feel upset and I would feel upset for a protracted period of time. And now on this higher level of vibration, oh, I'm just upset for a few minutes and now I'm laughing again and it's like it didn't even happen. That's also a way for you all to measure your healing and your growth. You repeat in part so you can see your journey and your journeys are exceptional. Yeah. And I think, feel like part of the journey too is responsibility. I, I long to have, by the way, a partner who can meet me there in that mm-hmm. because it's something, you know, I'm obviously not fabulous at anything all the time, but it's something I certainly learned a long time ago is to really look at myself and be able to apologize and own things when it is mine, but to have that as a co-creation in an intimate situation where a partner can say, mea culpa, that was me. I am so, you know, we need a little distance sometimes from that anger, but then to say that was me and I was wrong and I will never do it again. And, and, and here's how I'll show you going forward. That won't happen to really, you know, remorse is a beautiful thing to self-correct. Powerful magic is what it is. Apologizing and amends making, it is powerful magic. It changes our realities changes our realities, changes who we are, changes the dynamics of a relationship, yeah. allows a relationship. Yeah. Yes, 100%. Yeah. And if I may switch gears a little, because I um, I have so much fascination with fairies. <laughs> yes. And, <laughs> yeah, <Yay! laughs> me too. And this is something else that it's like, it was a Disney thing to me at some point, a cartoon thing, a Tinkerbell thing. And then boy, I turned a corner. And it's like, oh my goodness. And then it, um, I, I have not experienced fairies sober, but I have experienced fairies on mushrooms, mm. communication and sensing. I haven't mm. seen them, but I've sensed them. Mm. And I've sensed um, like when I was in a forest on mushrooms and I started singing, mm. I sensed that they were very happy. Mm. Uh, it was, it was, oh so beautiful. And they would guide me and tell me things like they would tell me things to do. They would guide me to a rock and they wanted me to check things out. And they would say what was in the rock and I would get there. And it was true. It was a whole cave (laughs) and magical. And so, yes, I have great love and curiosity about the fairies. This is Ursula. (laughs) Greetings. Greetings. So I am fifth dimensional. Mm. Most of the fairies you work with are either fifth or sixth dimensional beings. So we are not tiny little winged beings like Tinkerbell, right? Uh, We are gigantic beings of light. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of ways, we are primary guides right now for integration and reascension because we're fifth dimensional consciousness. So we hold that vibration fully And as you all are integrating your fifth dimensional consciousnesses, your higher selves, a lot of you are discovering that you are actually fairy yourself. So perhaps you might define yourself as a piece of your consciousness as fairy, or maybe even more feels like fairy. And you can kind of notice as you look at other humans, it's getting easier and easier to tell who the full fairies are and who the full ETs are and who the full dragons are and who, who the full gnomes are, et cetera, et cetera. And when we use the term the fairies, capital T, capital F, we are describing a realm that encompasses the gnomes, the elves, the brownies, the pixies, the dragons, the unicorns, on and on, as well as what you might define as the classic fairy. So there is the fairy realm, and then there are fairies, which I am one, Ursula, who, and I began my relationship with Nora as her cat. She adopted me years ago and knew immediately that I was bringing fairy energy through that feline form. And when I left my physical form in 2019, I let Nora know that I'd be coming back to work through her in this way, 
to which I said, this is Nora, no, hell no, sorry, right? Like, I'm not channeling my freaking cat, no. And yet, the very, I had a group transmission shortly after, her name was, uh, her name was the Smurf <laughs> in 3D life. Her name was Ursula, but it was too formal for her, so we nicknamed her the Smurf. When we adopted her, her name was Ursula, and uh she let me know that she'd be coming through and I was already channeling Kaliandra and Alderaan, other fairy beings. So, you know, I said, no, I won't be doing that. And then a few days later, uh, I opened my mouth to channel in a group session and she came right through and it just felt, of course, perfect. And even as I said, no, I'm not going to be the crazy cat lady channeling her dead cat, right? Even in fairy form, even as I said, no, I knew it was going to happen. I knew there was no stopping it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So she just brings, you know, such joy and love. And when when the Smurf died, um, we brought her body back to the house so the dogs could say goodbye, um, which I find very important for animals when they lose a sibling um, to, to really let them understand that a death has happened, just like with humans. Uh, it's so important, right, to have that point of contact and understand it and embrace it. And they all visited with her, each one of the dogs, and that, you know, then we buried her outside. And then John and I took a nap and the entire house was filled with the sound of her purring. It was the most healing, magical, right? I have these rare things that occur. I think this is true for all of us. They're pretty few and far between because if there were too many of them, it would distract us from having our 3D life. But there are these moments when those veils really vanish between realms and dimensions and the bigger magic comes through. And that was one of those moments to hear the house filled in an auditory way. This was not like my mind's eye. John and I both heard her purring loudly throughout the house. We had an experience once in when we lived in Encinitas. We were struggling in Encinitas. It was not working for us living there. Although living at the beach was amazing. It was fantastic, right? I'm seeing dolphins from my, my deck. It was amazing, but financially it was terrible. It was terrible for us for, for many reasons. So there was one night when we were really stressed out about it and we were sitting on our deck we had two cats then, uh, Isabella and the Smurf. And we looked up in the sky and there were gigantic cloud replications of our cats down to every whisker, every piece of hair. We both just were like, holy shit, right? Like, and to me, that was a message that everything was going to be okay. Mm -hmm. I actually said beautiful. to John, I asked John, like, what the hell does this mean? And he said, everything's going to be okay. And, and we moved to Ojai not long after that, um, which has been wonderful for us. Mm -hmm. Powerful. And how do we know? There were so many things that I got, <laughs> I had questions that popped as you were sharing all that. First, how do we know if we have fairy? How do we know? I don't oh, think we're I available to all of you. Right. So any any one of you can have relationships with us. Our recommendation is that's twofold. Find us in nature. So as you have done yourself, Debbie, that's an excellent place to connect. Uh, we're just more read of, readily available there. And if you'd like us to be in your home spaces, throw open your front door, stand at your doorway and invite us in. We appreciate a formal invitation to come and occupy your space with you. And would we open the door and formally invite the fairies? The fairies. Yeah, the fairies. This is Nora. And whom, whichever fairies are mm, connected to you, they will be the ones who, who appear. I'm so curious because I have heard that you have to be a little careful that some fairies are very mischievous and some don't like certain things you might do. 
is there a cautionary tale here? Do we need to be careful at all or I just put out the honey? Yeah, that's that's super that to me that feels like superstition. Now, I also think that this this is a part of the shift that we're going through. That may have been more true a hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, right? When our relationship with the fairy uh, energy was different on this world. Our relationship has changed. The winter solstice of 2012 really changed this. Okay, that's super helpful. And then how can we work with the fairies or how do we invite them? Like what kind of things can we do with them or would we ask them? We love to be involved in your creative projects. Mm. So invite us in when you're expressing yourself creatively or working on something creatively. It can be as simple as cooking, right? Or as expanded as putting a book out there or something bigger in that way. We love to be involved. We love to be involved in healing processes. We love play and music and magic. Invite us into your spell work. We will sit with you as you do magic and anything and everything can be a spell. You don't have to follow a formalized Wiccan practice or magical practice. Of course you can, we're not dissing them in any way, but we want you all to feel free to say, ah, if I create this intention and hold this vibration of joy in my body and light a candle, that's a spell. Cool. I love that so much. I've actually become very fascinated with magic mm. this year for the first or maybe the last six months. Mm. Um, I love the idea of magic, but I mean the idea of performing magic, not as in a show, but as in, you know, a creation. And so, and the only thing I've known to do is to Google it, right? Mm -hmm. Something I want to create, Google it and see what kind of spell is out there and then Mm -hmm. play around with it. I find it mind blowing, the potency. Yes, absolutely. I've, I've, I've got really into magic again. So it was something I'd been into and then kind of left behind during the pandemic. Mm. My excitement about magic got activated again, and I've, I've done some workshops and channeling on spell work and magic and the simplicity of using, you know, you, uh, this is the Pleiadians here, you, ask, you asked about being a creator being earlier, and we just want to touch on a couple of things here in response. One, number one, as creator beings, you are responsible for what you are bringing to the situation relationship project at hand, right? You cannot 100% create everything because you're always in collaboration with other energy and other beings. So it's, ah, I as a creator being am responsible for my piece of this bigger thing, whatever it is. And the fifth dimensional operating system uses vibration as the foundation for a creation, creationary adventure, whereas the third dimensional operating system uses emotion as the fuel for creation, Mm -hmm. not thoughts, Mm -hmm. not from our perspective, at least. There's some conversation around that, and that's fine, but the story we give is if your head is saying, I'm rich, I'm rich, I'm rich, but you feel poor in your emotions, you're going to experience issues with prosperity. There's a misalignment. Mm -hmm. Until you get to that emotional place within you where you begin to access true feelings of deserving abundance. Now, we're also not factoring in systemic issues, uh, issues of wealth inequality, racism, anti-Semitism, homophobia, all of that, that. That all contributes. And that's why we mean you are responsible as creative beings for what you personally are bringing to the experience. And sometimes you are limited by that bigger container in which you are working. And that's just a fact of your reality. And this is something else that you're all here to do. You know, these distortions of fear manifesting as hate on your world, some of what we just referenced, they're not to be integrated. They're to be healed and removed Mm -hmm. from your reality, removed. It's the suffering loop. They serve no purpose, none. You know, I got some shit the other day because I posted some pro-trans, a pro-trans statement on Instagram. Mm-hmm. And somebody came along and thought it was inappropriate for me to take a position on trans rights as a spiritual person. Like that's, that is just profoundly mind boggling to me, right? That anyone would have a problem with me or anyone 
in support of trans rights, gay rights, you know, being anti-racist, meeting anti-Semitism head on, recognizing it, calling it out, removing it. I feel like that's, that is what we're here to do. So I think there's some, there's some movement happening there in the community. That's the, the I'm talking about the bigger new age community. I think there's an ideology where, oh, if I'm just neutral, it'll all work out, right? Mm -hmm. If I take a side, I'm adding to the problem. Uh, mm -hmm. This is the Pleiadians, but you're in duality. Yeah. So if you stay neutral, there is no staying out of it. You're first of all, you're in it because you're part of the collective. And secondly, staying neutral is you just saying, yeah, I don't want to deal with it. I'm not going to be involved, which is basically you supporting the hate in whatever form it's taking. That is our perspective. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yes, it's such an important conversation. I know there are advanced civilizations around the galaxies who um, their predominant methodology or way of being is love, right? Yes, they're is beyond it. Self. Yes, they're so beyond it that yeah. they couldn't even comprehend yes. what we perpetrate on each other and the wars we create over it and the suffering we create over it. It's, yeah. yeah, it's an incredible level of insanity. I agree. And just for a note of levity, I want to call myself out because there are so many, uh, I could say blonde moments I've had in my life. <laughs> I've had one recently where um, I, I introduced many really beautiful, huge people, speakers at Conscious Life Expo recently. And uh, I'm not going to mention this person's name, but he's very big in the community. And I was so excited and someone took pictures. So I was posting those pictures on Instagram and I called him a trans channel, but I spelled it like a trans gender. <laughs> And he called me out so sweetly, but he said, Debbie, <laughs> incorrect use. <laughs> and my gender is definitely secure. However, and I was just like, oh, mama mia. So, <laughs> but you so, know, that that's such a fairy thing, though. I mean, Debbie, you clearly you clearly have a piece of your identity that's fairy as I'm really? as I'm. Oh, absolutely. Right. And that is. That is a little that sometimes the fairies, and I think this is why they can get the bad rap for being mischievous, right? Sometimes that fairy energy will insert something <laughs> that causes a hiccup, but that creates a bigger conversation hmm. that shifts an awareness, hmm. right? And that's not a suffering piece, really, although you may have suffered some embarrassment, right? Like I would in that moment, I would feel like. But it doesn't feel like it was huge. No. But I think that's hilarious. Also, you <laughs> substituted trans for trans as a so semi-conscious or conscious channel. I think that that is hilarious. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, he was very good natured about it. And <laughs> I course. did a total homage to him and a correction, a little edit there. But <clears throat> yeah, you know, here's what, what a great healing for all of us. So much for, for us to integrate um, to create the difference here on the planet. And I'm, I'm grateful this conversation's taking so many really great turns that I'm, I'm getting a lot out of. Um, I know the other things that just ugh, so hungry, this is like a buffet for me to talk to you. Ah, so first, Yeshua, um, I read <clears throat> must be a year and a half, two years ago now, the Tom Kenyon book, The Magdalene Manuscripts. Mm. And it unexpectedly had this profound, uh, when I, I had to finish the book first, and then I had this moment. I'm like, not one of those people goes, oh, past life, blah, blah, blah. But I had this moment where I'm like, I know this, mm -hmm. like something in my being intimately knows Magdalene and Yeshua intimately knows this Isis uh, sacred sexuality temple, this woof. It really, um, just even that thought uh, opened up so much in me. And I will say also what's so interesting, all these turns of um, opening to, because I, I'm Jewish and I grew up in New York, like a lot of stuff was weird to me. I didn't understand Christmas. I didn't understand mass. I didn't understand, we were friends with everybody because it's a melting pot there. So there's a lot of acceptance and knowing of each other's cultures and rituals, but I found there was something about the Jesus thing that was very difficult for me mm -hmm. and I resisted. And so also in reading that book, it suddenly turned all of that around yeah. for me. He became real. Yeah. And 
um, and something even that I knew, which was incredible to me. So I would love you to share some of what, what or who Yeshua is for you and how he or that energy manifests. And he is Arcturian, right? Uh, this, this is Yeshua. We greet you with love and joy and honor your light. There are many stories about who we are. We come through Nora as a we, mm -hmm. a collective, many beings working together as one in support of humanity. The story we tell is that about 2000 years ago, the polytheistic energy on planet Earth, which included interactions with extraterrestrials, got to the point where it created such a mess that it had a universal ramification. At that point, the Yeshua Collective came together and came to Earth to remove the polytheistic way of being and the power and control that was happening and put you all back into the understanding that there is one God, God is source energy, you are all source. So there were many of us who came during that period of time. The story of Jesus told in the Bible, that may have been about one person, it may have been, it may be an archetype, from our perspective, that is less important than the understanding of the Yeshua collective. So we did that. We left. A few hundred years passed. Those who were in power, politicians, priests, blah, 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 said, yeah, we don't really want humanity recognizing that they are source. So, OK, the one God idea thing, that, that works fine, but we'll put them out there. He's, out, he's up in a big chair in the sky, right? He's a big male patriarchal energy that runs the show <laughs> on this world. And that's been the story here. We're back. We're back in many forms. We're back here as Nora is channeling us. We are also incarnate currently on your world in many, working through many different humans, bringing the truth that we are all source energy. There is no separation. There is no, I am lesser than trying to get to this higher energy of God because we all started, you all started as source energy. That is the truth of your identity. You are source energy. You are love incarnate. You are not working your way up the ladder of dimensions to eventually get to this high place. You have already been that highest vibrational energy. You have descended to have experiences. So we are here now to serve that message, to continue what we started 2000 years ago. What can we be doing right now, Yeshua? You know, you have a bird's eye view and an understanding of the matrix of all that's happening. It is a very interesting time to be alive. It's really busy. It's, there's a lot of shifts in people's lives on a lot of levels. What can we do to stay centered, to stay grounded, to live the best life? And I don't mean this in a very, you know, airy, I don't know. I, I don't mean this pedestrian. I really mean this for those of us on the path um, who may be having a little bit of a tough time and really want to show up for the best possible days contributing, but also, you know, our experience. What do you see and know and how can you guide us? Yes. Yeah, so first, remember that you are valuable because you exist. There's still a need in the collective to seek one's value outside of the self because you believe that you have to do something to prove your value and your worth. And this is exhausting and depressing. So you are love incarnate, you are source energy, your value therefore is inherent in this. Then what you do becomes an expression of your value, an expression of your love, an expression of your worth, which means if what you choose to do today is just sit on the couch and rest, you are highly valuable and highly valued. This is that, again, taking us back to that 
encouragement around being gentle with the self. Two, the most important thing you will ever bring to this reality is your own personal experience. So the work is in first the self and then your relationships with others, your interactions, your willingness to be available and your ability to remember that vulnerability is not a weakness, but a strength. None of you have been victimized because you were vulnerable. You were victimized because you were in the presence of a predator. I'm going to let that land. Thank you. I receive that. The other thing, this is Nora, is, is I find for myself is it can be really easy to get distracted by all these big stories about what's happening, right, that kind of take you up and out. And if you notice that happening, that, that what you're tuning into is has gotten you really ungrounded and even disoriented, take a breath, get back into your body, do something really physical and grounding and fun. Yes, this is Ursula. Do not discount fun. The more joy you put into the field, the more joyful this reality becomes. End of story. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Ursula, because, you know, I notice there's so much available today and I'd love to get your take, Yeshua's take, anyone's take that, okay, there's, there's plant medicine, right? There's ayahuasca, there's yahe, there's Wachuma, there's mushrooms, there's workshops, there's sound baths, there's, you know, traveling and doing these ancient visits, there's, you know, electronic music, there's, uh, there's so much. <laughs> is there a modality that is wonderful to pursue? Or is it is it really all about just coming back to self? It's not it's out that. there or it's both. <laughs> it's, it is that, I mean, I'll speak from my own personal experience. So mm -hmm. I, I was guided very early on to not do anything to artificially alter my consciousness. It was almost immediate upon my um, beginnings of channeling. And I hadn't up till that point done anything other than smoke pot every once in a while, right? College. Um, so I have found that that's what works for me. I see those using plant medicine and I see people who are really helped by it. And then I see people who start to form dependency on it and tell themselves a story that the only reason they had the experience they had is because they were, oh, using ayahuasca or mushrooms or whatever it is. No, you had the experience because you had that experience. That's yours. That's your creation, right? So then the ayahuasca or the mushrooms or whatever is a permission slip, sure. Too much use of that permission slip can then create dependency and then actually become disempowering within the self. Yes, this is the Pleiadian. So part of the integration of the higher self or the fifth dimensional consciousness is being able to access all of these abilities from within the, your own body because that's what the fifth dimensional consciousness holds. So you don't need an assist. Yeah, it makes so much sense to me. And I feel like once you have an experience on a cellular level, you can never unexperience it. True. Yeah. So sort of like that time I mentioned on mushrooms with the yep. fairies, also something musically happened to me. I mm. never experienced before where I literally, I was, I was energetically in the matrix of music mm. and I could see music as it mm. was happening and playing and I could see where it was going and I knew where to insert myself vocally. Mm. That would, it, it was amazing to experience. Mm. And so I think at first it was like, oh, you got to take mushrooms again to get there. And I realized, no, we went there. Exactly. And so we have this now yes. inside of ourselves yes. as a reference point. Yes. And the mushrooms didn't really give it to you. You gave it to you. The mushrooms were just a per permission slip for your mental body to deactivate the implant that was disallowing you from accessing that multidimensional experience in the first place. Oh, I like that <laughs> explanation so much. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do Lyria, do Lyria, do Lyrans. I think I'm so from there. Anyway, to the, the <laughs> oh, planet. Oh, well, that's fascinating because they have a very strong relationship with the fairies, the Lyrans. 
Ah, didn't know that. That's yes. so interesting. Lions and fairies. Yes. This goes back to a galactic history piece that I started channeling about mm, maybe a decade ago or so about the first Earth, uh, which is a planet that existed outside of Orion's belt that was inhabited by uh, fairies, physically incarnate fairies, who had access to fifth dimensional technology, full access to their 5D technology in a civilization called Lemuria. So there's, mm -hmm. you know, there are two stories about Lemuria, right? That there was a Lemuria off Earth, and then Lemuria was on this planet. And none of those, like, ever fully resonated with me. And what I finally got as I began to access the story was, oh, Lemuria started on another planet and then was brought to this planet. So the fairies, the, the Orion Wars started, the Lyrans were part of that, the Pleiadians, the Syrians, the Arcturus, there was just, it was like the worst, it was like Star Wars, right, <laughs> out there. And uh, the fairies didn't want any part of it. The Lemurians on the first Earth were like, yeah, no thanks, we, we're not interested in that. So they created a cloaking technology that made the planet invisible. A few hundred years passed, everyone forgot that that planet even existed. The war continued. It was like a thousand years war. Uh, the Lyrans, there was a Lyran starship that, as I'm telling this story, I need to say, right, maybe this is mythology, maybe this is metaphor. Maybe it happened, maybe it didn't, doesn't really matter. The story has meaning. Uh, a Lyran spaceship badly damaged, entered the atmosphere of the first Earth, and the fairies, the Lemurians, made a decision to let that ship land. The Lyrans and the fairies, Lemurians, then began a relationship with one another. They just fell in love with each other. The Lyrans being these highly advanced technological and intellectual beings who were connected to their emotions. So they're not like the Zeta Reticula that have had disconnected their emotions. They're very emotional, but intellect was was prioritized. They love the fairies, right? It was like, oh my God, right? Like your love of the fairies, right? It's like, oh my God, like look at these beings and look what they could do. And holy shit, they do that with their bodies and we have to make a machine to do it. And then uh, the Pleiadians and Sirens got together. They couldn't get to the Lyra star system and the planets there. So they formulated a plan to destroy the first Earth. And the Lyrans got wind of it, staged a rescue mission. There was no way to defend the planet. Um, and I mean, they did try it, but it, there, there was no way to really, cause, because there were no defenses at that point on the planet. And for the fairies who had, so this is like the archetypal metaphor for spiritual bypassing. The fairies, Lemurians, instead of being engaged in what was happening in the universe, they disappeared themselves for 300 years. As they came back into full view, they had 300 years worth of karmic baggage and energy to catch up on, right? So the first earth was destroyed. Many of those beings came here to this world. There was a Lyran fairy hybrid created that race. That's what they look like, a Lyran fairy hybrid. I'm not oh. visual. I'm not visual. So I don't get information visually oh. like you're asking, right? So I don't, I don't have a seeing. I don't have a way to see it. I have the energy of it, the understanding of it. Um, then there was another hybrid created where that archetype, that prototype, the, the Lyran fairy Lemurian hybrid, they picked earthlings that they thought were a bit more expanded intellectually and wove those genetics into the earthly construct. When Lemuria fell on this world, prior to Lemuria falling, those hybrids were sent to Atlantis. And then prior to Atlantis falling, those hybrids went all throughout the world. And it is a unifying piece of genetic information that connects every single earthling, everyone. That's fascinating. I've never heard that before. Thank you so much. Um, and how interesting, because that was actually my question, which, and you went so much deeper. What, what was that connection? The Lyrans and the Lemurians, um, both places, I feel some kind of connection and probably most people do. And especially maybe if you're in California, right? Or Hawaii. Yes. Uh, very, 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 very interesting. And um, do you think we, those of us who came back from that time have, have a, a 
a different purpose other than the collective purpose? Uh, this is the Pleiadians here. Well, we wouldn't necessarily say different because everyone has individual right things they wanted to do. Yes, you have an individual, <laughs> say individual purpose, yes. <laughs> Yes, it's just there was a desire prior to incarnating to access those records. Uh, one of the things that's happening right now on your world is your society uh, very much parallels and reflects what was happening prior to the fall of Atlantis. Right. Uh, and from our perspective, Atlantis fell because the yin and yang energy tore apart. Mm -hmm. And as the yin and yang, male, female, but we don't like to use gender terms right now. We use yin and yang. As those energies ripped apart, the physical manifestation was the sinking of the continent and other natural disasters. And Atlantis did not fall in a day. It took decades for that all to physically play out. So it looks like on your world right now, you have a repeat of this. It looks like you're becoming more divided. Actually, from our perspective, what's happening is the yin is beginning to rise again. It's causing a lot of discomfort for anyone who's holding on to patriarchal constructs when the when the world became yang dominant. And that happened during the fall of Atlantis, the world became yang dominant. So as the yin is rising, it's causing all of this discomfort. It's being highlighted then in, again, all of these distortions of fear manifesting as hate. But the yin is rising. It's not, it's not going to stop. So what's happening from our perspective right now is not a tearing apart. It's actually what we're calling reunification. Right, right. Yeah, the underbelly has to be shown in order to be healed and for the light to be shown on it. Yes. I agree. Uncomfortable, but still necessary. Terribly uncomfortable. And I don't in any way want to say that the suffering that is happening is good. It's not, it doesn't feel good to me. It's not good. Mm -hmm. doesn't feel necessary. The suffering is happening due to resistance because those who are holding on to the patriarchal structures from that place of fear until their fingers are bleeding, right? That's what it feels like to me. That's, that's, that's the issue. If yeah. there could be just a relax into the heart and an embrace of the yin rising, and we do need an overbalance of yin right yeah. now mm -hmm. because we've been yang dominant on this world. So we are going to have to skew it the other way for a bit of time until we find that true equitable yin yang balance. I'm fascinated to see how it will play out. And then I'm also very aware of just the devastation. Yeah, I'm also really politically active. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked on two presidential campaigns while being a direct voice channel. They knew that's what I did. And I was very much welcomed into the fold. And as I got involved, I questioned whether it was appropriate, kind of like that person questioning whether it was appropriate for me to talk about trans rights, right? I questioned the appropriateness. And Yeshua, the Pleiadians, all of them were like, of course, mm. politics are huge on your world. Why wouldn't you bring your love to that energy? Why wouldn't you fight as an agent of change in that way? Yes. Yeah. I, I'm highly aware too. And thank you for doing that work. That's yeah. really big to step yeah. up and take action, put, put your talents where your mouth is, you know, where, where the energy is required. I mean, I'm watching Texas as an indicator right now and everything with abortion rights and what's going on with these new pills and medications and so forth and women's bodies. And I'm watching other countries. Um, some of Iran. them. Iran. Yes. And there yeah. are terrible suppression yeah. and punishment of yeah. women. I mean, yeah, it's yes. real, right? Like that's, that's whether this is an illusion or not, I don't really know, but what I know is it's also very fucking real. And these are real lives. Yes. Just like the Nazis were real. That happened. The end right? There's real pain and suffering. And I deal with a lot of that in past life trauma that comes up so often Holocaust trauma. Oh, how interesting. And then there's also the idea of second generation. I mean, I'm, yes. I'm genetic yeah. trauma, ancestral trauma. It's carried in the body. Yes. Yeah. There's yeah. And for those of you who are listening and probably most of you, you, your lineage has directly been involved in yes. some kind of war. I'm a second generation. My father, his story with the Holocaust, it's a movie. It's yeah. beyond what he and his family went through. And 
Um, not everybody made it out, but you know, and I learned early on in my twenties when I think I was doing something and I met a rabbi and and he heard, a, he asked me questions. I told him a little of my, my family's story. And he said, oh, you're second generation. And I had never heard that word. And he said, oh, sweetie, you should go to a group mm. because you don't even realize things that are playing out in your life mm. that have nothing to do with you. Mm. It was your father's and mm. his mother and father and their experience, but it's, it's here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. genetically and yeah. you carry that trauma and wow how very interesting how very interesting to explore that and what big shoulders we have to clean up for our lineage and our ancestors that you know most of us are very capable of doing that yes my first past life memory was being in the warsaw ghetto i was eight years old when i had the memory i didn't know what the hell i was remembering came in a dream but it was very clear that as I got older and learned about the Holocaust, that that is what I had been remembering. Wow. And how did you work with that? Because that's pretty big. You know, initially it was just a fascination of that period of time and feeling the horror of it as I've done Reiki and other healing work. It's, you know, I, I'm not going to say that I've healed completely uh, the circumstances of that journey because I don't see completion in when it comes to healing, I see evolution. But my perspective is that we're always healing. We're on the spectrum of healing. That's brought me such relief, to be honest, Debbie, right? I used to think like, I got to finish this healing thing before this life ends or whatever. Now I'm like, yeah, no. Right. So when it comes up for me, I recognize, oh, that's what's coming up for me right now. Right. Like when I hear Holocaust deniers, my rage gets immediately activated. Mm, Immediately. And that's that's that unhealed trauma. Right. And the rage then that just the inability to actually see what has happened on the ground on this world to Mm -hmm. want to bypass that in some way. Amazing. Um, The last group I'm interested in is the angelics. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that for you includes the Elohim at all, because I've a lot of fascination with the Elohim. I don't use that term. So I'm going to say no, but Mm -hmm. I've definitely met others who have strong, when I I talk about the angelics, it's it's typically usually the Archangel Michael. He's my, he's my (laughs) bae. He's your, your boo. He's my bae, yeah. (laughs) He's my spiritual boo. Yeah, John and I, John and I have my husband and I, he's not, he's actually not my husband. I call him my husband because after 24 years together, there's not really another word that describes it. Right. But we're not legally married because we're also Aquarians. So we like to eschew any traditional way of being he and I. So we are right partners. Uh, he and I both like the thing we love, I, like Michael to me is just this big, powerful, loving presence that both encourages the speaking of truth Mm. but sometimes the darkest hardest truths so he's very much a facilitator when I'm doing when I'm work uh, in shadow work whether I'm channeling him or not right and I don't often direct voice channel Michael I did a lot more of channeling of Michael oh years and years ago now I'm primarily the Pleiadians Yeshua and Ursula those are like my big, my big three, you know, kind of what I'm known for. But Michael is always there. But John and I also have this joke about Michael that anything that happens on this world that we don't like is his fault for some reason. That's like we do feel like that's probably an inside joke that we just have with that <laughs> that group of beings. Uh, this is the Pleiadians here, but there's a question you have about angelics. So from our perspective, there's an angelic realm that is present on every dimension. Mm. So one of the reasons why angelics were the first, kind of really the first to be really accepted on planet Earth, you see it in all of your religious texts, is because they are present with you in the third dimension. They just don't take physical form. Well, they can take physical form. They can, and they do at times. Yes, I once, I know, I once had an angel help me out uh, at the side of the road. I was driving and I thought, shit, I'm going to get a flat tire. And about one minute later, I got a flat tire and I pulled over and I put my head down. And before I even put my head up, a guy had pulled over. He got out. He fixed my, he, he changed my tire. I went to get some money for him just to thank him. He was gone. Like I didn't even see his car. It was gone. 
So I know that angelics can, and that is because they are able to inhabit every single dimension. And I can't say more than that because I'm asking this question right now and I can't get the answer, right? So there's still things that like my mental body, as much as I've taken in, it just doesn't, can't comprehend. I'm trying, to, what I'm trying to ask right now is are there beings who are always only angelic? The Pleiadians are like, no, you know that, you know the answer to that question is no. But there are beings, so when you first choose to incarnate, when you go up, and reintegrate with the oversoul, you can come back in angelic form. I do know and have worked with a lot of humans who carry a lot of angelic energy with them. That to me feels like it's in their records where they have inhabited, they've incarnated in angelic form many, many times. Those who have that really strong angelic energy, from my experience, are typically super sensitive, really empathic, very much perfectionists, and have a really hard time being human. Oh. That can be a byproduct of bringing that angelic energy through the physical body. That's a fascinating answer. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah, the question I had, <clears throat> well, I don't know if it's a question, but when you said Archangel Michael is his, he speaks the truth, I had such a pain, mm. like immediately right here, in my head. It was fascinating. I don't know what that is, but it was like that expression. And I don't understand what it means, but I know it felt really powerful to hear you say that, that that is, that is, a, a, I don't know, a job of his, a mission of his, his way of being. Yeah. What does that mean exactly? The truth? Uh, this is the Pleiadians, like no bullshit, just very clear right? For you, what you experienced there may have been a deactivation of an outdated implant about your belief system around angelics and kind of embracing a bigger understanding of the angelic energy and the force it can take. One of the other things Michael does is that energy is very much in support of children and children who need protection. So the Michael energy will often sit with a child who is being abused to offer some protective shielding, whatever can be offered energetically in those moments. Oh, we and that need goes line, hand, Michael. Hmm. Yes, and that goes hand in hand with the truth speaking. Excellent. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you, and and I like that explanation. I'll take it. You know, uh, any any kind of old, outdated implant to be gone. I I want to be fully here. I want to you know operate more like the twenty year olds. Who, and, and less who have come in with so, <laughs> so much less encumbered, right? Um, to really fly and be the rainbow, indigo, gorgeous beings. Uh, they really are equipped. Um, I'm impressed. I know people, people who are older love to say, oh, you know, the younger generation, when I was a kid, all that mm. stuff. And I've never felt like that. I actually <laughs> look at them like, oh, if I could do it again and be your age, I'm um, obviously with what I know, but also with these, yes, the challenges, but there's amazing opportunities now and ways that they be with each other of acceptance in an expression that I didn't have growing up. And I, oh, I, and opportunities. I think it's beautiful. Completely agreed. Like the sexual and gender fluidity of this, these younger, be I'm bisexual. I, I mean, the shit I dealt with as I came out mm -hmm. around being bisexual in my 20s to my family and others was, it was enormous. That was back, that was in the mid 90s, right? Today, it's just so, I have so many clients with bisexual kids who are just like, oh yeah, they're bisexual. And they're like, it's nothing, right? Or gay or, or, or trans even. Yeah, exactly. You know, I have a family member who came out um, young and uh, so I'm just trying to protect everybody, but one of the family <laughs> members was saying to his sister, you know, something about it to open up that conversation. She's a big like, whatever. What? Yeah. yeah, he's that, whatever. He's this, he's whatever. And it's like, yes, you know, yes. having, and I'm sure you can relate having grown up in theater you know, for me, when I was, I was so young when I started going to summer stock mm. camp. And so I don't know, I was so, nothing years old, maybe eight years old, 10 years old at a summer stock, 12, I don't know. But I fell in love with the, the dance teacher. And somebody said, 
oh, you know, cutie, you can't love him like that because he's in love with a male piano player and he was a male too. And I'm like, oh. And so for me, it was just like, oh, well, bummer for me. Mm -hmm. And I moved on. And so I was introduced to that whole arena of that whole buffet of choices. Yeah. And it's just how we existed. And, you know, people who are performers, you know, since ancient times, this is what we know. And and I also want to say the word ancient comes out of me. This has been going on since ad infinitum. Yeah, hello. <laughs> this is nothing new. Yeah, I know the word, the culture wars. Give me a freaking break. I hate when that term is used. It means nothing. They're not culture wars happening. They're real. There's real hatred right now being magnified due to unhealed trauma and distortions of fear. That's it. Yeah. And often I got to tell you, their choices have nothing to do with you and yeah. will never interfere with you. will never, yeah. you know, I can't say they won't uh, cross paths because maybe you work with them. I mean, this yeah. used to happen an old, old, old job I had where thank God this company honored everything. And, you mm. know, yeah, sometimes we had males come into the female bathroom because X, Y, Z, and it was, it was fascinating. Like, yeah. It is. It just is. And my God, there's so many bigger things. To deal with, right? Yes. 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 Yeah. And so Nora, what do you do every day to keep yourself grounded, centered, healthy, happy, all of that? Mm -hmm. Do you have a practice or a ritual? Oh yeah. No, <laughs> <laughs> I really don't. It was just, and that's kind of like my method, right? Is as opposed to, I mean, if I need to sit down and breathe for a minute, I might, right? If I need to go in and find some joy in my body, I might. But for me, it's more outwardly expressing my joy is and love as often as I can in my life and in the community. I will say that my dogs are a huge help. Uh, living in Ojai in this amazingly beautiful small town and natural environment is a huge help, right? There are things I'm very fortunate and I recognize that I am fortunate to be able to live where I live and have the life that I have, right? And I still struggle. I think we all struggle, but I'm very grateful. I, I think I put my attention there as well because I channel all the time. I guess that's why I also don't have kind of a regular practice personally, because it's just, it's always happening. It's I'm in session or out, or it's just, I'm just always feeling connected. And again, that doesn't mean I don't have a bad day or week. <laughs> I can have a bad week, just like anyone else. Well, but I love the question. Thank you. Where can people work with you? Where, what, what's the best way? Do you have events yeah. coming up? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So uh, I'm available for private sessions via phone and internationally via Skype. I'm just working by audio right now. Um, and I'm not seeing people in person. I kind of stopped doing that. Part of living in a small town is understanding how to be in a small town. And Ojai is, it is a very small town. And at some point I realized I couldn't be inviting community members into my home for healing and then running into them at the grocery store, you know, three hours later. So, but I do also do uh, monthly transmissions where the Pleiadians, Ursula, Yeshua, this is pre predominantly the Pleiadians, and then those two show up as well as add-ons, will I'll channel for a half hour to 45 minutes, then we'll do Q&A with the callers. And then I do... Um, Bigger events, like I have a spring equinox event happening on the 21st, that's also by teleconference. So that's a two hour long event. Uh, it'll be more dense channeled information and then Q&A more, more topically. Uh, I'm teaching Reiki classes via Zoom and I have a channeling class coming up via Zoom. That's a three week class. So John and I teach those classes together and he's always present and I'm pointing to him because that's where his room is, uh, his office, his music studio. John is also a composer. So we have the music thing happening here as well, interfacing. He, uh, the channeling class is really just so much fun. Uh, we did two rounds uh, the la over the last six months. So this will be our third round of channeling class coming in open to anybody and everyone who's had experiences or none at all. I've had often people come in saying I've never ever experienced contact. And by the end of the 
even the end of the first day, there's contact established. And those classes are very small, so I can work one on one when needed. Excellent. Also, do you do you or the Pleiadians activate people to help this to facilitate this to happen so they can channel? Yes. Yeah, that's huge. That's and that's a part of the class. That's that's just it's also part of working with me one on one. That energy is just present for that. Mm, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's so awesome. I'm curious. So it sounds like the best thing is to sign up on your website. To yes. Get started, Nora. Thank you. N o r a Herald. H e r o l d dot com. You can sign up there or look at the events specifically and register. Yes. And my dear, my God, I have loved this time with you more than there are words. Mm -hmm. So I just energetically send that to you mm -hmm. for real. This is dare to dream. What are you next dare to dream? What are your future desires and creations? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is very personal for me. Like John and I rent, we'd like to own our own home. So that is a dream. Um, I'm thinking about the world right now. Of course, my dream for the world is that we live in an equitable reality where everyone's uh, basic and primary needs are easily met and more. Um, that's uh, my bigger dream. Uh, okay, I'm going to keep it to that for now. <laughs> there's something else I'm working on, but I'm not ready to say it out loud. <laughs> okay. Well, I support you in all of those, including the unmentioned, but still that is in the inception Thank and the you. project creation. Um, may I see and be a witness for all of those to come true for you. You are welcome back on the show for mm -hmm. sure. And again, folks, noraherald.com. And I end today's show with this quote from Leo Buscaglia. Ancient Egyptians believed that upon death, they would be asked two questions and their answers would determine whether they could continue their journey in the afterlife. The first question was, did you bring joy? And the second was, did you find joy? Mm. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, the weekly Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger. Leave a comment. I read them all and share this with somebody you know will enjoy listening to this conversation. If you heard us on podcast and you want to see us, go to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger. And next week on the show, I'm featuring the amazing Alexander Quinn who works as a spiritual metaphysical coach and is a leading voice in the Starseed community. Alexander is from the UK, huge following. Can't wait to talk to him, really unique guy, and he will be channeling. Thank you all for joining us today. And truly, truly, I think the overall message that we heard amongst many beautiful takeaways was the joy, find the joy and be gentle with yourself. Till next time.